Sure. And then um, I am uh, going to give you the agenda. Okay. So, hi. I'm Cynthia Allen. It's very good to be with you. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a, in a few moments in case you don't know much about me. Uh, here's what the schedule is going to be like today as you continue to Wenatchee, 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 Washington. That's a, that's a tongue, tongue twister for me. Um, here's what the agenda will be like. We will be starting right here with a little bit of a check in with each other and, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own story. I'm going to give you a movement lesson. And then I'm going to tell you about an opportunity and then I'm going to give you another movement lesson and then I'm uh, going to uh, Take question and answers and I'll try to take them uh, a significant number of question and answers. So if we run over two hours, that'll be okay with me as long as I hold up and and as long as you hold up. So with a group this size, we might have have quite a lot. I really appreciate hearing again, just everybody keep piling in where they're from. That's fabulous. We'll just take some moments here to get get us all together. Okay. So I think Probably some of you feel like you know me. I mean, some of you actually know me quite well, and others of you have been following me for a few months. And then there's others of you that are completely new to hearing about me or the Feldenkrais Method. So I'm going to start telling you a little bit about my own, my own story and a, a journey to health. And then um, I want to find out from, from you all in a minute um, who is new here and who is experienced with the work. So I have a little idea of what we've got going on. So um, so where to begin? So I am uh, Cynthia Allen. I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, rhymes with paradise. Feldenkrais rhymes with paradise. And uh, um, I think it helps if you have a mnemonic, because that word Feldenkrais is very hard to get out of the out of the mouth the first few times, isn't it? It's not so simple, and um, and so a little rhyming thing helps a little bit. So what is it? How in the world did I end up in Fel in Feldenkrais? Because it's an obscure thing, and this is the probably the most common question I get asked: is how did you end up in it? So I was in healthcare management, had been in healthcare management from the beginning of my career, doing wellness programming development, um, uh, programs around, well, actually wellness occupational medicine was my start. And then I went into managing ambulatory care centers and a lot of, uh, lot of exposure to a lot of different things at a time when you could get exposure to a million different things. It's so different now. And then um, did also medical billing for a number of years, did, started a consulting division for an accounting firm for practice management. But in my 20s, it was just really, my latter 20s, it was really obvious that I was going to have to make some changes. I was someone who as a child did not have great movement patterns. I started out very early in life with chronic pain, both physical and emotional. There's a lot of trauma in my life. But there also seems to have been some other kinds of developmental issues. Um, somebody has said that the sound is breaking up. Are you having trouble with sound? No. Okay, the majority of people are not. So I'm just gonna say if you're having trouble with sound, you might need to turn your video camera off and see if that frees up some bandwidth for you. And um, so, you know, we all have a lot of stories, don't we, coming out of our lives, either how our lives began or things that happened to us. So I'm no exception to that. Uh, I had a skill set because I was raised on a farm in Missouri. I had a skill set that pretty much everybody in my family seems to have, have gained, and that was how to make things look good. So we have always known how to make, like, make things look good on the outside when things on the inside could be a total mess. 
And there's some value to that skill for sure. <laughs> so it allowed me to go out and uh, become successful while my life internally was continuing to devolve. I got, I moved away from home. I, uh, you know, started my career. I got married. I looked great from the outside. And as I entered into my latter 20s, early 30s, my marriage started to fall apart. My mother was dying in Missouri. I started traveling back and forth to be with her. And my own physical health had just gotten to the point that even though I had been physically uncomfortable a lot, right up until that point, now I just couldn't really function. I couldn't make it through the grocery store. Like pushing the cart would be too much for me. I might get stuff in the cart, set it off to the side, go out to the car, rest, come back, push the grocery cart some more. Or I would have just huge fear that I would need to call back in, call back to my car on my hands or knees because that was something I had to do sometimes as a child because my knees hurt so badly. I just had such extreme fatigue and my emotional status was bad, just really bad. So I started doing lots of things. I mean, I really didn't have any choice. It was sort of like, this is not a life worth living moment that most of us have had at some point. You know, this thing where you just come up against something and you just can't go any further. And so I began uh, psychotherapy and then I started doing other forms of art therapy or group therapy and massage therapy, cranial sacral therapy, spiritual direction, shamanic work. I did a lot of things and um, creative process a lot with creative process and you know these things were helpful to me they really they really were helpful to me but i was still having a lot of physical pain and i also was still having really regular post-traumatic stress nightmares so that i still was pretty you know i was still pretty non-functional even though i would say i'd probably gained about 50 percent of my capacity uh, back or I mean, I don't even know back probably tapped it for the first time in my life through this other work and so my husband and I were trying to figure out you know what my new husband and I were trying to figure out what could we take as a class as a new couple together what could we take as a class that uh, exploration that we might both enjoy and there was a holistic center nearby and there was a brochure uh, for this center that had all a bunch of classes listed. And so he took a copy, I took a copy, and we both checked off what we thought we might like to take, and then we looked for a match. Well, one of them was a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement class. And um, I had been referred to the work several times, but I had ignored it. I just thought I was already doing enough. I couldn't imagine what else I would do. And in that process, I... Um, that Larry and I thought, well, let's, let's go give this a try. So we took the class and uh, that very first night of, after that class, I had the most remarkable dream. So you know those childhood toys, those spinners that you use, you know, where you pull and it's, it's something like in the middle of a button or something spins on it and then you let it go and then you pull it and it spins. Well, I had this dream that my spine um, was, um, was like one of those spinner toys. And there was this luminous butterfly in the middle of it. And it started to ravel, uh, unravel and, and fly up and down, but it was an unraveling sensation is how I would see it. It was this luminous, beautiful picture. And I was like, wow, okay. I have no idea what happened in that class that I found so annoying and really frankly stupid. That's really how I felt about it. It was a sitting lesson and it's a classic sitting lesson that you all have probably done if you've had any exposure to Feldenkrais. It's a classic sitting lesson. What you're doing, all these different small, slow turning, different parts. I just thought it was ridiculous. I had never done anything so slow and so carefully and so nonsensical in my life. And then I have this dream. I think, okay, that's something. So I don't know, Catherine, probably the year for that would have been about 1995, I would say. Catherine asked that question I saw pop up. I think it would have been about 1995. So um, over the course of the next year, I um, continued off and on to take the classes. 
Now for me, the classes themselves were not really super enjoyable. Um, they were hard for me because my nervous system is, uh, tends to run high. And I, so at that time, I didn't have any capacity for learning how at all to, to modulate. It only had one speed. And so I go to these classes and the class was asking me, you know, saying, hey, there's another speed. Did you know there's another speed? You could do something different. So it was, they were challenging for me. But in the, during the week, I just started to feel increasingly fabulous. Like I would walk around and think, who could possibly feel this good? Can anybody feel this good? I, I don't, that doesn't even make sense to me. I didn't know that was possible. That's not that I didn't also have some pain and difficulty at the same time. And this is one of the things, one of the important stages of growth is that people can feel that they can both feel fabulous and have some pain and difficulty, that these both things can happen at the same time. And um, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. And still, I didn't go regularly. I would come, I would go, I would come, I would go. And then, and then my husband and I started going together again. He had dropped out, then we started going together again. And then one night after about a year, uh, the instructor says to me, you know, we're organizing a, a training program to begin in a few months in Cincinnati and you get such incredible benefit out of it. Are you sure you don't want to take this training? And I said, oh, no, 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 that's not possible. And I had a list of objections that I gave her. Boom, 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 boom. She really shocked me, to be honest. And she said, well, I don't think this one really counts. And I don't think this one really counts. And I don't think this one really counts. This last one here, I can help you with. Here's a brochure. And why don't you see if you think about it? So I, Larry and I went out to the car. He was driving. I got into the driver's side. I mean, I got into the passenger side. He gets in and I started to cry. And Larry said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, I'm coming home. This was so crystal clear to me then and now. So that is what I hope for all of you, that you would have an opportunity to come home to yourself and then keep going. Now I see people are sharing what year they began in their Feldenkrais work because of Barbara's question, or Catherine's question, and I appreciate that. I would love to hear next, who is completely new here tonight? or today, whatever time it is where you live. So if you would just put in the, in the chat, new, we want to know who's new. It's wonderful to see the people with experience, but it's also good, oh, good, great, thank you. Oh, good, quite a lot, wonderful. So we've got, we've got a big variety here. I see that there are people here that have been in the Feldenkrais work much, much longer than I have, and then I, I see people that are new, so it's good to have that entire range. Thank you so much. So what is this thing called the Feldenkrais Method? So I'm um, going to give you your first experience of that, perhaps. And um, maybe, we'll see, for some of you, maybe even a, the experience I'm about to give you is something that even if you've done Feldenkrais is new, because this is not a real common lesson to teach for people in uh, public classes. So for this lesson, it will be helpful for those of you who can sit comfortably on the floor to find yourself a place on the floor, but probably, pal probably pad up your pelvis. But those of you who can't sit comfortably, and you hear me emphasizing this word, comfortably, you're gonna sit in a chair. Now, I don't need you to go to the floor yet because I'm gonna give you a walking test, but I want you to start to get yourself situated. Now, as you get yourself situated, for those of you who are gonna be in a chair, I'm just gonna show you a couple of options for the chair. It would be fabulous if you had a pillow or a step stool that you could put your feet on, something that elevates your feet a little bit so that you might not be sitting cross-legged on the floor, but you might have your knees a little bit above your pelvis. It's not mandatory. You're still gonna get benefit from the lesson if you don't have that option. I'm just giving you the setup for something more ideal. 
you will. Good. Okay. So let's do the little standing test first. So if you'll come up to stand, everyone who's able to stand, come up to stand. And begin to feel for yourself what is the quality of the sitting on the floor. You're just going to sit on the floor cross-legged when we get there, and you'll sit on a on an elevated surface, I hope. Um, so in the standing position, you just feel the quality of your standing, the quality of your body leaning on your legs, you're sitting on your legs. And you can feel perhaps the outside edge of your hip joints. And you can feel perhaps the inside edge of your hip joints. Huh? That's a new one, isn't it? How many people feel the inside edge of their hip joints? Not so many, yeah? And as you begin to now take this into walking, please listen to the quality of how your body weight comes onto your right leg. Each time you step onto your right foot, your right leg, listen to the quality of how it leans on your right leg, stands on your right leg. How stable does your right foot, knee, hip feel to you? Do you have a feeling that something along the chain is not quite what it needs to be for you to be really comfortable every time you come under the right leg? Or does this feel like super solid? And then how about if you were to wonder about your inside right ankle bone? Do you have any sense that your body weight lines up over your inside edge right ankle bone? Okay, and then pause with that and let's try it with the left leg. Begin to walk around, find your body weight as it comes onto your right leg and feel for yourself again. What is the solidness of this leg for you? The reliability, the stability. Is this a more stable leg for you, less? And how about what happens for you in the knee, in the hip? Do they seem like they really hold you well or is there some feeling there that you missed the mark? And what about this idea of the weight along your inside edge, uh, left ankle bone, lining up somewhere, stacking somewhere on top of that? Okay. Good. And then also you notice how your shoulders feel, you notice how your head feels, your neck feels, and then you're gonna come to your seated position. Your seated position will be either, either on a chair or on the floor with your legs crossed. Take your time. Now, I want to talk a little bit about taking care of yourself. And so I got some notes from some people asking me questions like, hey, I just had surgery a few days ago. Can I do this program? And the answer is probably not. I think it's very important to say that while the Feldenkrais method is highly gentle, it is not meant to be done by everybody on every day. There's some lessons that you can probably do by just about everybody on every day, but tonight's lessons may not be those. So if you just had hip surgery, you just had a fracture, these are the kinds of emails I got. I mean, literally just in the last few days or couple of months, you need to be careful. If you've been given instructions from your doctor uh, on, or your healthcare provider on certain movements that you should not do, then please do not do them. It's very, very important. You can do them in your imagination and you may get a huge amount of benefit from it. So as we go along, please don't push yourself in a way that you're not sure is okay for you, right? you or you've been told is not okay for you. 
So let's begin as you sit in the position. You want to be kind of square. So like I see somebody on a kind of catty corner on their, their stool. So be sure that you kind of feel square to yourself. And you're going to have maybe your feet propped up on a stool if you're in a chair or a pillow. But if not, you could still maybe be able to cross your ankles and just see what that's like for you. It doesn't matter a lot if you don't cross them. It's not the end of the world. And then in that position, go ahead and look a little bit up and a little bit down and just see what it's like for you for your neck. Can you be able to do that with the easy, easy range, super easy range for looking up and looking down. Slow, slow, gentle, gentle. And then pause after you've kind of got a sense of what that's like, looking out on the horizon. And then turn to look a little to the left, a little to the right, and also find out for yourself what's that range like? What's that easy range like to look left and right? And what does it feel like, the quality in your neck and your shoulders as you look one direction and the other? Okay, so that's our some of our beginning extra reference movements. We do reference movements like you did in walking, so you can compare to later. We'll talk about why that's so important. Now pause and bring your right hand up to rest on your head. Okay, just rest on your head and just feel what that's like for you. Now, there might be some people that may not be able to bring their hand to the head and that's fine. You could just do that in your imagination. You could use the other hand to come back to the C. Now in this position, just slide the elbow forward. So you pivot on the hand, you let the hand slide on the head, slide the elbow forward and slide it a little bit back. Give yourself a nice hairdo. And as you do that, start to feel the quality of how your collarbone opens, how your shoulder blade goes towards your spine. And just notice what your range of motion is like. Okay, good. And let's let that come down. Let your hand rest for a moment. This will be a very symmetrical lesson. Now, please bring your left hand up to your head, right on the top there, same thing. And start to take the elbow forward and a little bit back and a little bit forward and a little bit back and just feel, you know, is this side simpler, easier to feel what happens in the shoulder blade? or less? Does the elbow open more easily out to the side or does it feel more restricted? You're just noticing. Good, and let your hand come down. Now, many of us have on shirts that have seams down the side. Just take your left hand to the right side of your body and just run it down and highlight for yourself where that seam would be. Yeah, I mean, if you don't, if you have a t-shirt on that doesn't have a seam for some reason, you can still imagine where that seam might be. Good. So now bring your right hand up and see if you can bring your elbow, approximate your elbow out to the side in line with that side seam. Now, if that is uncomfortable for you, like you're here and you go, look, that, that's what I got. That's okay. That's okay. But if for you, it turns out that when I give you that image, you go, oh, yeah. I can do that, then go ahead and bring it in line with the side of the body, side seam. Or if you're here, notice where it's at because we're gonna move in the side direction. So now the head, hand is glued on the head. You're not gonna let it slide any longer. Your elbow is out to the side wherever it can be for you. And you're gonna think about taking that elbow down towards the ground in the direction to stay with the side plane, with that side seam, and then you're gonna come back up. And then you take it down and you come back up. Now, you'll feel a little bit of weight shift in the pelvis, but if you're in a elevated foot position or you're cross-legged on the floor, you're actually not gonna feel a lot. And the more that your elbow is in that side plane, the more that you're gonna feel the movement in the upper ribs and less in the pelvis. Upper ribs, I mean these ribs way up underneath the armpit. Okay, good. And let it go, let your hand come down. Now you can take a rest anytime that you like. You don't have to continue to 
do this movement. If you're on a chair, is it important to have the legs crossed or can the legs be, um, can the legs be the knees pinned in front? Yeah, they could be pinned in front, meaning touching, they could be touching in front. Um, it's not that important that they're crossed actually. It's, it, it can be helpful, but it can, it's not helpful if it's not helpful, right? It can be helpful only if it's helpful. <laughs> so find within the constraints of the position, get as comfortable, make it as comfortable as you can in the direction that we're going and it'll still work for you. I'm, I feel really confident it'll still work for you. Okay, so now let's bring the left hand up to the head. And again, you want that left elbow along the side seam of the body. Um, and now you think we're gonna take the elbow down, but we're not. We're gonna glue the hand to the head and we're gonna take it up. We're gonna take it up, that's it, and coming back. Now in all these movements, it's very important that you're not pushing and pulling on the neck. That's not where we're trying to get the movement from. We're trying to get the movement from within this breastbone, within this rib structure. So if you can include in your image, oh, that breastbone goes up and feel how long you're getting on the right side and how compressed you're getting on the left side. And it's not really important that it's a big movement because we're mostly interested in these upper ribs. We don't need to see that a lot happens down below. It's these upper ones for most of us that don't get a lot of movement. That's nice. Good, and rest your hand. We'll just make this a very symmetrical, going back and forth kind of lesson. Is that music that's neighborhood music coming through on my mic? We've got, I've got a band still suddenly started playing in the backyard, so I, I hope that's, that's the first time, I don't know. There is a little uh, alcove out here, community alcove, but I've never had anybody play there. We've been here a year and a half. It's the first time. Okay, so let's bring the uh, interlace the fingers actually, put them on top of the head, and then bring your elbows open and start to take your right elbow down and just really, and the left elbow of course is coming up and just really Feel that quality of this sort of turning of the mid back, of the chest, of the ribs. But your job is to keep the elbows in the side plane. So what you're gonna wanna do, especially those in cross-legged sitting with the knees higher, you're gonna wanna take an elbow forward. Don't let it happen. That means even if the movement is tiny, stay at tiny, but keep the elbows in the side plane instead of letting it slide forward. It's very common that you wanna slide forward. And then maybe go over as you breathe out. And as you come up, breathe in. And try to, to stop looking at me the whole time and start maybe closing your eyes for some of the movements so that you don't Fix your gaze, it's nice, good. And let it go when you need to, let your hands come down. You don't need to take notes, by the way, you're gonna get a replay. I see some of you busy writing things. I mean, you can if you want to, but you can have the experience and take notes later. I'll give you a replay, it's up to you. Good, and just pause and feel your breath and your bum on the ground or on the chair. Mm -hmm. So we've been playing with going to the right. Let's see what it's like to go to the left. Why don't you change over the crossing of the ankles or the knees if you have them crossed. And bring your left hand up to be on top of your head. Find that side seam, whatever's available to you. We're not trying to go for anything uncomfortable. And start to take the elbow down, which of course the head goes with it, but it's not the same as pulling on the neck. Avoid pulling on the neck. Make the motion underneath the armpit. Think of the motion as being underneath the armpit. And then as you come down, you Feel a little bit of shift in the pelvis, but not probably a huge amount. Probably not probably a huge amount. And maybe breathe out as you go over. 
Good. Okay, let it go. Have a little rest there with the hand. So the head does follow the arm because the hand is glued to the head in our imagination. So the head will go along, but the hand isn't sliding on the head and it's not pulling on the head. It's something else. Good question. So now bring your right hand up to the top of the head, the elbow in the air, and take your elbow up. So again, we're lengthening on that right side, shortening on the left, and coming back. Gentle, gentle, feeling what's available to you. Can you begin to get to know those upper ribs, those mid and upper ribs? Good, let it go and hand come down. <clears throat> and interlace your fingers. See what is your habitual way of interlacing. Which thumb do you want to have on top? And then move all the fingers over at one position. <coughs> Bring your hands to be on top of your head. And still you're going to go down to the left. The right elbow is coming up towards the ceiling and then coming back. Yeah, Martha, then take a break. Lay down. You don't want to keep going if you feel exhausted. It's a tiring, it's a tiring movement if you've not been used to this. So take that what you've done already may be enough for you. We're going to do a very relaxing lesson as our second lesson. And then your hands come down and you take a pause. Okay, now we're going to come up and walk around a little bit and see what's changing already in your gait, in your walking. What's changing? So maybe already you're feeling, hey, there's something. There's something to this. There's something that's a little more reliable in my legs, something more solid. A little less tendency for shearing through the hip or a little less torsion on the sacrum or a little more ease of motion in the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, let's see if some of you can do a uh, a tall kneeling, a proposal kneeling position. So you would need to probably have a little padding under your knee, under one knee, and we're gonna be on the right knee first, the left foot flat on the ground. So take a moment to set that up. If you need to, to be someplace where you can touch something for stability, that's okay. So you'll be the right knee on the ground, the left foot standing, like you're getting ready to propose to someone. Women, a lot of women here, a lot of women tonight, women don't do so much for posing, but the men know what the position is, I can see. <clears throat> Good, now in that position, you have your uh, left hand on your thigh, place your right hand on top of your head. Now, if you need to put your left hand out to touch something to be safe, of course, do that. And in that way, is the knee forward or more to the side? It would be better if the knee is forward. It would be better if the, 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 the left knee is in a stair step 90 degree angle position and your torso is over it. That may not be possible right now. Okay, so there is where we're headed and then there's what's possible. And so you're going to place your right hand on the top of your head. Your left hand is on your thigh or hanging down at the side or touching something for stability. Find the side seam of your right side and start to take your right elbow down and then bring it back up. Now, as you take the right elbow down, start to notice what happens in the weight on your right knee. What happens to the weight of the knee on the ground? Uh, Barbara Shaw. You've got the wrong hand situation, Barbara. Yes, I can describe it again. You have the left, the you have the right knee on the ground, the left foot in standing. The right, you're on your right knee and the left foot. Left knee is bent. 
the right knee you're resting on. You have your left hand on your thigh. You have your right hand on top of your head. Now, as you feel your weight going, as you feel yourself shifting and you feel the weight in the knee, start to try to find the inside edge of the right knee. Find the inside edge of the right knee. And start to push through the inside edge of the right knee to bring yourself back up kind of quickly. And if you don't know what that means, you just take a guess. Like, where would be the inside edge of my right knee? And how could I push myself back up to upright with it? And anybody who feels like this is too much, don't worry. I'm going to give you a really second lesson that's relaxing and available. Okay. Let it go. Let it go for a moment and change over the knees. We'll be off of the knees very shortly. I know I'm taking a risk here with this lesson for a group, but I want to... Yeah, if you can't kneel, just wait, just wait. You can try putting a foot on a chair. Some people put a knee on the chair or put a foot on the chair, uh, but uh, you know, you can also just wait, no worries. So now you have your right hand on the thigh and your left hand on top of your head. Just, uh huh. That's it, good. You all are doing great. And start to take your left elbow down to the side. No, you don't have to worry about the court, and the core, Toby. I don't think so, unless you feels like you need to do that for your safety. I don't think you need to worry about that. And then you start to find the inside edge of that left knee as you go down. And then see if you can kind of press through the inside edge of the left knee to bring yourself back up kind of quickly. So you kind of go down slow, and then you come up quickly. And you go down slow, and you come up more quickly. So a little different in the speed. Excellent, let it go, let it go. Come on up to stand. Okay, good. And just feel the quality of your body leaning on your legs. And then walk around a little bit. You're doing great. What does that mean? It means if you're taking care of yourself, you're doing great. Uh -huh. So Joyce noticed that she wanted to lean more on her standing foot than on her knee. Uh -huh. Okay, so now can you come back to either sitting cross-legged on the ground or in your chair? And if you, needed, you found out that cross-legged on the ground wasn't for you, then come to a chair. We're just going to do a couple more movements in the seated position to, to see what's changed, what's more available. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So let's just interlace the fingers and put them on the top of the head. And let's just take that elbows and see if it's a little easier to come into the, the side seam area, the side plane. And then take the right elbow down, very slow, come back to the middle, then take the left elbow down. And just attend to whether one elbow wants to travel forward or not. Try to see if you can stay in the side plane without the elbow traveling forward as you go down. It makes a big difference. And then in this down position, let's say you're down with the right elbow down, can you press somehow through the sitting bones to bring yourself up and over to the other side? And then can you press somehow through the sitting bones to bring yourself up and over to the other side? Is there anything you could do there that would give you just a little bit of extra connection? Nice, good. Let it go, put your hands down. Allow yourself to look a little bit up and see if anything is easier about looking up. If you have less strain on your neck, can you look up and down? Looks better. And then turn a little to look left or right or right or left. And how is that range for you and the quality in your neck? Okay. And then one last time, please come up to standing. And let's, let's really tune in now in a bigger way to what has happened. 
So as you stand, you feel the height of yourself and then begin to walk around and listen to that weight as it comes onto your right leg. Terry says she has legs cracking in her neck as she's turning her head. And I think she's the one who said earlier she had a lot. So what's the quality of your, of your body weight coming onto your right leg like now? Do you know something a little bit more about the inside ankle bone? reliability of it. Maybe less strain in the hip, maybe more freedom in the shoulder. And then pay attention to a few times as you come onto the left leg. Sit, nice. And walk around a few more moments just for yourself. At different speeds. And then come to stand and one last moment before we sit down and I ask you to share some of your experience in the standing position. I asked earlier, you know, what did you feel about the way your body sat on the hip joints and did you know anything about the inside edge of the hip joints? And just see if there's something, some different quality about how the weight of your body is sitting on the legs that might highlight for you, not just the outside edge, but the inside edge of the hip joints, the solidness there. Okay, good. And then you can come and have a, a seat when you're ready. And if you like, you can type in, key in your experience, a little bit about your experience of what you noticed or didn't notice or found great or found objectionable or, um, wonder about, take your time, there's no hurry. It's very important that we not hurry even when we have an agenda. Wow, look at this range. My right shoulder feels more stable, more fluid, easy movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice, big, fabulous. My balance on my hips, I have more space between my hips. Um, Two, two, um, what was that, two months? Two months post ankle surgery and after the kneeling exercise, I feel like I'm less, I feel less like I'm limping. That's nice, right? That's nice. Bit more weight in my heels, a little less discomfort, balance more secure, less tension in the neck and shoulders. Aha, uh -huh. so Tara realized that she was using her head as the motivator to move her arms. That's a great distinction. Lola noticed the difference awareness on the inside of the hip bones. My collarbones are more fluid. Yeah. Legs seem to bend more over the feet, I think. Maybe that was what she was saying. More weight in my, yeah, I see, I think I read that. But very wobbly on my legs initially, but more solid now. This is from Jackie who has some scoliosis less pain in the crease of the hip. Neck feels looser. Um, I don't know, Marlene, does that, that feel in your mid back comfortable, uncomfortable, you're not sure? So sh Susan's got more movement in her shoulders, awareness of the inside hip bones, yeah, good. Spine feels more alive, feet connected, walking taller. I'm looking to see if anybody wants to Say things didn't go good for them. Lots of surprises uh, for Sir Cynthia, I think it was. Yeah, one leg balanced more secure and longer. Surprise, surprise. That's great. I love that. Love the feeling of the mid ribs. Okay, so Marlene's with mid back discomfort. Okay, yeah. So, you know, you learn something also when you have something that you didn't expect to be uncomfortable, and it is. But I'm gonna guess that, uh, oh, plantar fasciitis feels better. That's good. I'm gonna guess that um, that will go away very quickly. So let's, let's find out um, if that's true over the next, uh, even might be while we're together, but definitely usually goes, that kind of uh, discomfort or di uh, kind of goes away with you get out and function a little bit more. Not looking for that. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying that's what I think will happen. Um, so somebody with a nerve impingement sustained two and a half weeks ago, still painful to turn the neck. Yeah, that 
that might, I mean, there's some potential in that one for nerve impingement to be really good, but it probably wouldn't be my first setup for working with you on that issue. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is tell you a little bit about what's coming up as an opportunity. Um, and then uh, we're gonna do another movement lesson. And then we're going to uh, just really, really get into some, dig into some question and answers. So let's see here, I'm gonna. See if I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay. Just got it here. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit here about what is somatic education and what does it mean to have a learning body. And so somatic education is this broad umbrella under which the Feldenkrais method fits. Uh, it was a uh, more or less a phrase that was uh, coined by Thomas Hanna, one of Feldenkrais's, Dr. Feldenkrais's students. And for me, I define it as living through your learning body. So it's a process of really being in touch with this organic state of learning through sensation, learning through sensation and movement. Um, and that movement could be something really subtle, uh, like through the movement of the breath or the movement of the emotions that we might not think about, or it could be larger, like what we've been exploring with today, larger movements. And then you can just, just take it in as many different directions as you want to. So the question really, if you came here today, is you're, you're somewhere now and you wanna travel from some place to somewhere else. And so I'm gonna ask you to put in your comments where you want to travel from to to. So people sometimes have an injury, a pain, something. He would take a moment to actually type in the comments where I'm at now, where I want to go. So there's some reason that you tuned in here. Let's see what you have that you are, uh, can, can uh, allow yourself to frame in your mind. So Camilla wants to go from less pain to something else. Camilla, it's important to know what you want to go to. Sharon, pain to comfort. Uh, Rosanna, pain to freedom. Okay. And understanding. Okay. Oh gosh, it's going to happen fast now. Painful hip, weakness to strength, stillness to flowing. I'm going to get fast. Push from push, push, push to ease. Uh, from limited range to more range, from tightness to flexibility, from Limited walking uh, in, and pain because of it to more walking. Hi, from hyperflexibility to pro, proper proprioception, that's good. Able to do uh, gardening, great. Hollow to neutral back. Post-surgery achiness from stability, yeah. Flexibility in my left arm and shoulder. Pat, yes. Limit, from limited range of motion to full range from Meg. Uh-huh, Yavana. Yes, thank you. So beautiful, keep putting those in because it's important for you to know what it is that you want. And without you knowing what it is that you want, then, um, you know, you don't really have an idea of a goal. A couple blocks of walking to miles, good. So people usually mention things like pain, limitation, injury, fear lack of confidence, disappointment in their body, and they might wanna be going over to something like ease or comfort, better balance, walking, running, confidence, what Ruthie Align calls biological optimism. 
and uh, inspired living, right? So that you don't, your whole life is not revolving around what is wrong for you. So these are fabulous that you're putting here for us. And it's fabulous for you to state that. So the big question is how, how do you get there? How do we get there? Now, it's really easy, of course, to accept option one, and that's usually to continue doing what we have been doing. Now, I'm not gonna make fun of that because it, you know, like remember when I um, said that I didn't think maybe the Feldenkrais work was for me and I kind of skipped it for a while. Hi, Laurie, good to see you. Inspired living sound, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on out there, isn't there? Um, so I'm not making fun of the fact that, that you may be doing something that is at least partially working for you and you may be choosing to just continue to do what you're doing. What this looks like for a lot of people right now uh, is that they are uh, taking a dip and a free something here or there. They're going out and finding a free YouTube video. They maybe even sample a course. And so that's certainly okay. Option number two would be to take my nine week entry course that's gonna go about the to help you understand these keys, these seven keys that I've pulled out to restoring um, your learning body and, and to experience transforming movement lessons. And so the movement lessons will uh, really follow an entire theme for a, an hour together. They're pretty close to it. And this is what the nine week um, system might be, the nine week class might be. Uh, like I need to make a little change here in my screen to see what's going on. There we go. So it's I'm calling it unlocking your learning body, and it will have the seven keys to switching on your learning body that I have come to define. And I want to just give us a couple of quotes to help us understand what this my idea might be like. So Moshe Feldenkrais said, "Life is a process, and processes go well when you have." more than one way to influence them. I love people continuing to write in here. Just keep it up as you cl clarify that for yourself. Life is a process and processes go well when you have more than one way to influence them. Huh, well this is a big statement and I hope that somebody helps me come back to that later so we can go into it a little bit more. And then Socrates said to know thyself is wisdom and both of these things are built in to the Feldenkrais method. It's built into this idea of returning to your learning body. So let's take a, a kind of quick look at these seven keys. And I'm not gonna go into them a lot of detail because I will go into them a lot of detail in the class, but um, I wanna give you an overview of them. And the first one is to respect yourself. So you started to hear me talk about this tonight and you know, First of all, to respect yourself, you have to know yourself. And, and so it's a, a dance. This process of knowing yourself is a dance so that you know yourself better, then you can respect yourself more. And respecting yourself has more than to do with just their physical organizational structure. It also has to do with understanding your history and your belief system and your emotional world. Learning to slow down and take time, it is huge, huge. It's the setup for almost everything else. You really can't learn to do much of anything new without slowing down. You can learn to eventually go fast, but almost all new skill has to start going slowly. And there's other reasons why we wanna go slowly as well, because it has a big impact on quality, be able to develop quality. Sensing differences, knowing the difference between this and that. This is the root of learning and this is the difference. The primary difference in traditional exercise rehab programs is we put the emphasis on learning to sense differences instead of getting to the outcome. Unique but meaningful stimulation and this means that if you want to actually get something new out of your brain into your body, then you need to have lessons that take you down pathways previously untraveled. And this is something that the Feldenkrais work is particularly good at, taking you down pathways that previously you have untraveled. You learn to explore sequencing and timing 
And so we did a little bit of that tonight. We'll do more of that in the next lesson, this feeling of, hey, something's come in certain order, but also something about going slower or going faster. And when is each one right? Identifying unhelpful habits and beliefs. This is big. Now, already for you, you may have found this coming up. Like you may have heard yourself say something to yourself like, oh, I, I can't do that movement. And then you found out you could do it. Or you thought, hey, uh, I can do that. Yeah, this is, this is a super easy class. This is really doable. And then you went, hold it. I don't seem to know how to do this. How come I wouldn't know how to do that? So it can go a lot of different directions. You may have already thought, hey, that change happened awful fast. That's not really possible, is it? So you're starting to come up against a belief. And so we can make these a little bit more clear. Sometimes they definitely are um, a little bit hazy in our mind, but through the way that we teach and interact with each other in a class, we can make these clearer. And the last one is creative engagement, which was so huge for me in my life. Now, there is creativity within the Feldenkrais lessons that carry over into your life. But I think it's also important to stretch out our wings a bit more in this idea of creative engagement, particularly if we've been pretty debilitated with pain, depression, trauma. So what does the nine week class include? It includes seven Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement lessons. It includes the seven keys to switching on your learning body. There'll be a lecture for a key each week. There'll be small group discussions and you're gonna find these to be very helpful. And um, in terms of getting to know other people and being heard, but, but also the quality of your learning is gonna really increase with this. There'll be of course weekly reminders to come in and attend. There will be replays available and you will have an audio only download. So you'll be able to download the audio. And then there'll be question and answers for each week. So this is a pretty hefty class um, that's available. And then I'm also gonna to talk to you a path, about a path to success using somatic approaches. And this is a really, uh, really a unique thing that I have to offer. The seven keys in this path to success, I think are extremely, gonna be extremely interesting for you. Now this class is gonna meet on either Monday nights, well, Monday nights for my time zone, not for Australia, at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or Friday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And it will begin the week of September 14th. And the fee for this nine-week class is $300. Now, there's a third option. And the third option is to think even beyond the class and to engage in a structured program with ongoing engagement and a, a, that defined path to success. And this option is to actually join the Your Learning Body community, which is $47 a month. Now in this Your Learning Body community, you get actually the entire thing we just talked about, the nine week course. So this $300 course you get, and then you get streaming downloadable short videos. There's over 40 of them with more to come, and that's a value of $400. Then you get these audio lessons. I see Elise coming up. Elise has been in the community for a while. Maybe she'll say something about her experience, although the community's changing here. Patty's been in the community too. I'm trying to think who else is in here. Uh, you might say something too, Patty, about your experience over there in the comments. So the audio lessons, that are uh, also are streamable and downloadable. There's over 150 of those, and that's a value of 750. Plus, you get the live, you're gonna get other live classes or challenges throughout the year, and that's a value of over 1,200. You get the seven keys, like we talked about before. You get a success path that you can monitor. You get the Facebook discussion group. So all of this is worth over $3,000. And then there's some bonuses. There's the Sound or Sleep lessons by Larry Wells. There are uh, some Select Bones for Life lessons that I've done. And then Larry Wells has also done some NLP meditation. So there's bonuses that are almost $400. So what does that come to? Well, you could do the live entry course for $300, a one-time fee. You could do the monthly membership at $47, which includes everything we just talked about. And then you could do 
a yearly membership, which you would get two months free, and that's 487. So you have, that adds up to $94 a year in savings. So you have three options, and these last two, the 47 a month or the yearly fee, is what allows you to access the value that's over $3,555. Now, Arlene's gonna put in the comments for you this uh, link, because if you sign up while the course is still hap while our session is still happening tonight, you will be entered into a live event. Uh, this live event bonus only happens while you're here with me tonight, and you can do this during the Q and A. <clears throat> and that is, you'll be entered into get to receive a private session from me, and this will be given away ten of those. And they'll happen sometime between now and the end of the year. Ah, Kathy, yes, she's in the lessons as well. Thank you, Kathy. I see Elise spoke up. Kathy's speaking up. Thanks. And, um, <clears throat> and what will happen in these private sessions is you'll tell me what's going on with you. I'll ask to watch about some of your movement. And then I will um, give you a small lesson in the session. And then I'm gonna give you a list of lessons and the order in which I think that you should do them for maybe the next quarter or so. So you'll have like a pathway laid out for you that is, <clears throat> that'll work for you around your particular issue. Also, uh, just for the fun of it, because I want you to know that it's important that we also have fun. We have a mascot in your learning body. Now, some of you that are already members knows about it. But though some of you, five of you are going to be entered into drawing to get an actual mascot, a stuffed animal mascot shipped to you anywhere that Amazon will ship. And then if you sign up for this part of it, the, the Your Learning Body part, uh, at the party, the Your Learning Body party, you'll, uh, you'll get to find, you'll get introduced to the mascot as well. So who, who has already been in the membership? You saw a couple comments over there. I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the people and what they've been getting out of it. Yvonne is a fabulous story. She came to see me a few years ago and then um, you know, hadn't seen her for a while. And then she came back in to see me privately before COVID maybe about four or five times. I can't remember the number of times. She was in really severe pain. She had given up painting, and for someone who's really big into decorating, that's huge. She had given up playing the flute, had, had been really excited about joining some new um, ensembles and had to give that up. And so we had a few sessions where she got some immediate improvement, but she also joined your learning body. And this becomes important because we went off for three weeks to Costa Rica. And so there was almost, between our travel and everything, like five weeks that Yvonne couldn't see me. And when she wrote me a note and got when she was ready to come back, she wrote me a note and said, you're not gonna believe this. You're not gonna believe this, but while you were gone, I did the lessons in your learning body. And then I started to think, I wonder if I could paint again, if it would be okay for my neck and my shoulders. And then I thought, hey, I don't have to commit to painting a whole room. I could just paint a wall, and even if I can't finish that wall, somebody else could finish it. And before she knew it, she had painted the entire room in four days, doing a wall a day. That was pretty remarkable for her. Here she talks about the change in her idea from deterioration to having a future. Yeah, it's something that would be unfolding instead of this downward spiral. Here is Andy Gallo. Andy is a Felding, uh, is a a physical therapist, uh, completely new to the work when he came to it. And he's, he had a shoulder, elbow, hand pain. He's a manual therapist, so he's doing a lot of hands-on work with people. And um, he said, I really love this feeling I get, like this immediate feeling. And he said, and I want to be able to give that feeling to my clients. I want my patients to be able to get it. That just everywhere in my body, there's less strain. And he had a lot of improvement in his shoulder, his hands, his elbows, and he also said he gets better sleep. Now, about one third of our membership is uh, people who are in some kind of helping field. And so they, um, <clears throat> they're, it's interesting to me because in the beginning, I thought of the membership as being only for people outside the helping field. But when I realized a third of them were in the field and they were getting a lot out of it, not only for themselves, but for others, 
I started to really go, oh, okay, there's more here than I realized for people that are, that are new to Feldenkrais, including therapists. Lynn, Lynn uh, is a, a horse, horsewoman, an equestrian, and she really likes how it's changed her connection to the horse and her feeling of her body in relationship to the horse. She also talks about the fact that she goes to a body worker a month monthly and that he, he feels her body is holding up much better. Marguerite has had some really significant uh, neurological problems that have happened for her. And so she joined uh, less than a year ago and for her, it's giving her an, uh, a way to start signing in two to three times a week. And she finds it creeping into her daily habits. She can feel the difference. And she knew she wanted to somehow captivate, use that, that Feldenkrais work, that Feldenkrais magic that she was feeling to be more in her daily life. Jay, I love the story of Jay because, well, we don't see too many super young people that do Feldenkrais sometimes. And it's a shame because there is some of the most, well, first of all, some of the people in most in pain that I have ever worked with have been people in college age. Now, Jay is in his 30s. He was hit by a car when he was uh, still in high school. And that certainly changed the trajectory of his life and made him want to become a physical therapist. And so he talks about how much he loves the change from this goal orientation to less effort that he gets with the Feldenkrais work and that he's been able to use some of the movement patterns to help with his clients and, and make the manual therapy really stick. And what's really important is he feels that the lessons have helped him to get back to consistent running and even doing a half marathon. Big shift for him. So there is so much that can happen as we explore. And there's so many ways that we can explore. Uh, Elise, you're out there. This is your picture, Elise. <laughs> Elise and some of these people become like the learning body poster children right, over time. And this is actually Arlene. Arlene's in the background somewhere. So again, I'd like to just say you have three ways that you could participate. If you don't want to continue doing what you've been doing and you really want to do something new, you could sign up for the one-time course of $300. Yeah, that's fine, Elise. I appreciate those of you who've hung in as you did, and maybe you'll watch the replay for the second lesson. And then you could just sign up for the monthly membership, which is 47 a month, and do the course. Or you could do the yearly and even save more money doing the yearly. So Arlene will put that link for you again in the chat. So we want to really explore possibility, right? What can happen for us in this possibility, this realm of possibility? That's so, so big, isn't it? Possibility. When you feel possibility, you do become less and less obsessed with what's not working in your life. And this is huge. It's not about solving every single problem that we have. It's not about waiting to live life until there is no pain, is no discomfort. It's about finding the way that we can begin to explore possibility as, as that discomfort starts to lessen, as that, that range of, of uh, motion starts to open, as we begin to really know ourselves and we find ourselves to be worthy, right? To be worthy, to be lovable, to enjoy ourselves to enjoy our own body instead of finding only what is not right with it. So there's so much here in this world of possibility for what can happen for you. Now I am gonna take questions, but I'm gonna do them all at the end now, because I wanna take you to another movement lesson. And then while I'm answering questions, if you want, you can um, sign up for the program and get entered into the drawing. So this next lesson is going to be in on your back or sideline, either on the floor or a firm bed will work. You don't need to see me for this lesson. And it's a very traditional 
Feldenkrais lesson. It's a very calming lesson. So just go ahead and bring yourself to your side lying position or start on your back, but know that you're gonna to go to your side and you'll need some padding probably under your head. So you don't want your head hanging way down. A little bit of padding under your head will probably be helpful. I appreciate all you taking your time to spend with me tonight. I know it's um, a big decision right there, right? To spend time together this way. <clears throat> so you're coming to lie on your back or you're uh, on the bed or on the floor. Hopefully you, everybody has a bed if you don't comfortable on the floor. And as you lie there on your back, maybe start to notice the connection with the ground. I'm going to give a couple more minutes. I see some people still trying to figure out how that's going to be for them. So no, no hurry. And as you are lying here now, looks like most people are ready. You just, just follow your breath, breath in and breath out. Just feel the quality of breath arising and breath falling. And notice that that for you means you feel like you need to breathe a certain way. Or could you just let breath be what it wants to be without any need to control it? As you're lying here on the floor, do you feel, or on the bed, do you feel that you need to lie in a certain way? Do you have some idea about how you're supposed to lie on your back? Are you squeezing the shoulder blades? Are you keeping your palms, your orientation of your arms in a certain way? What would be more comfortable? Is there something you could do with your arms or your legs that would be more comfortable? What if that was the way to lie on the ground? was to choose your comfort. And as you adjust yourself, begin to notice what points of contact do you have. Now, these questions are starting to help you distinguish differences. To notice points of contact means you also notice points that aren't touching. And this is key. This isn't minor at all. And there's gradations to this that can just keep growing. So at first you might think very grossly, but as you develop, you can think more and more clearly at deeper and deeper levels, even about this idea of what is touching and what is not touching. So maybe take a little bit of a stroll down the right side of the body and notice how the right shoulder blade is on the ground and compare it to how the left shoulder blade is. How the right side of the mid and lower ribs are in relationship to the ground. How much of them touch? And is there a difference on the left side between the contact? And then on the back of the pelvis, it's the weight like on the back of the pelvis. And then how about on the legs, if your legs are long? Which leg, as you go down the back of the right leg, where's the points of contact and where are the spaces? And how is that different from the left leg? There's no reason that they should be the same. We're not meant to be symmetrical. We don't have to be symmetrical. And then the weight in the feet, if your knees are bent, the weight on the whole foot of the right foot, if your leg is long on the back of your heel, is there more pressing, more weight on one heel, one foot than the other? And then just gently, slowly roll your head a little bit to one side and then the other. And notice the quality of the rolling. And notice if you have a tendency to roll until you feel a stretch or a pain. And then maybe you 
you don't really need to do that. Maybe it's not about the distance. Maybe it's about the quality. Good. And when you've done that and you felt something about that quality, maybe take your glasses off and roll onto a side that you could be on for a while. So I would remove glasses and roll onto a side that you could be on for a while. As you come onto the side, I think that music's really getting ramped up here, isn't it? Yeah. Gonna send us into the blues here. Um, as you come onto your side, you put it, put a little padding under your head and then kind of make yourself into the shape of a chair. So you have your long spine, your head above your spine, you have your knees bent, and then you have your lower legs parallel to your spine. As if somebody set you upright, would be like a chair. Yeah, I'm glad it doesn't wrap as well. Please bring your arms out to shoulder height in front of you so that your bottom arm is long in front of you and your top arm, the hand is on top of it. So the arms are long in front, the hands are on top of each other. And just feel what it's like to lie on this side, this way. Feel your breath against the ground in this position. And then lift your top arm and take it to whatever degree is comfortable for you. Maybe that's pointed towards the ceiling. Maybe it's a little bit behind you. Just notice what your easy, comfortable range is like right now. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then you come back down. And I can see already that some of you have done this lesson before. You, you know, the people who are experienced already kind of know where we're going. But for those of you who are new, of course, this is a new idea. So let's, let's start with the very basics. Bring the arm back down to rest. And now you're gonna begin to lift that upper arm, but only like an inch. And you're gonna lift it in a way that the wrist comes up first, and then the fingertips come away. And then the fingertips come back and touch, and then the whole palm of the hand touches. And then each time that you bring it back down, you let it stop and you pause for a moment and then you bring it back up again. And then you let it come down and you feel the quality of the hand touching the other hand and then you pause for a moment. Now you're gonna start to add that you maybe add an inch or two each time that you bring the hand or the arm away. And you're gonna look, even if your eyes are closed, you're gonna look at that hanging thumb or the hanging fingertips. So your eyes are gonna to start to follow the movement of the hand, the arm up, and the movement of the hand and the arm back down to resting. And you're not going all the way. You're not going all the way. No, 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 don't go all the way. It is so tempting, isn't it? An inch or two at a time. It's not, you're not gonna be anywhere close to having your arm behind you. Why? Why do you have your arm already behind you? Yeah, ask yourself that if you're doing that. Maybe you don't have a choice. Maybe it's just so intolerable to go this slow. And that's okay. If you know what you're doing, it's okay. You know what you're choosing. And then slowly coming back down. That's it. Yeah, and so you're just taking your time. I mean, like, this is so luxurious, like there is nothing in the world to be concerned about. Uh -huh. And then as the arm gets a little bit higher, I see now people are starting to get close to where the arm would be towards the ceiling. So the next time that your arm is facing towards the ceiling, pause there. and then lift it a little bit closer to the ceiling. So you slide the shoulder blade away from the spine, and then you let the shoulder blade slide a little bit back towards the spine, and then away from the spine and a little bit back towards the spine. That's it. Good, and now let's add that every time you reach a little more towards the ceiling, you rotate the shaft of the arm. Where would you like to rotate it? Is it gonna be thumb towards the hip or thumb away from the hip? 
And when you let the arm kind of shorten, you unrotate and the shoulder blade sort of slides back. It's not really that you bring the arm all the way down unless you need to take a rest. It doesn't need to go behind you at all. It's just towards the ceiling and then away from the ceiling. Good. And let that go and slowly bring your eyes to follow your arm as it comes back down to be long against the other hand. And roll onto your back and take a pause on your back if you like. This gives you an opportunity to feel what might be changing in your contact with the ground. We've done just a very few movements. And in my experience, this usually already has change in contact. That's pretty remarkable for that to happen so quickly. Pretty remarkable. And just roll your head a little bit, left and right, and see if there's anything that's different there in the quality of the rolling. And then pause with that and slowly roll back onto the same side unless you need to change because you found out that wasn't your best side to rest on. Take your time to set yourself up into this chair-like position. One arm on top of the other out in front of you. Knees bent in front of your waist. The lower legs parallel to your spine. Good, and let's see how your comfortable, easy range for that arm has changed. So go ahead and let your head nice follow it and see if it's easier to take a little further overhead or behind you than before. Wow. Uh -huh. And then come back. And then this time just take the arm to be facing towards the ceiling and let your head nice follow it and stay there for a moment. Now we're gonna change the movement and you're gonna to start to take, you're gonna leave your head and eyes looking at the ceiling. You're gonna to start to take your arm a little bit back towards the other hand, not behind you, back towards the other hand. While your head and eyes look at the ceiling, take your hand, arm back towards the other hand. And then stop there when the, other, oh, the arm is back towards the other hand. And now when you lift the arm back towards the ceiling, take your head and eyes towards the floor in front of you. So start to move your head and eyes and your arm opposite each other. They don't need to go a long ways opposite each other, just a small amount. That's it, back and forth. Good. Back and forth, that's it. That's it, just see if you can make that simpler. Good, and then let your head and eyes look at the, uh, head, eyes and arm look at each other again and bring them back to rest on the arm in front of you. Good. Good. Now, Thinking about that wrist coming off first and the fingertips hanging behind and your eyes following the movement, begin to take the arms slowly in the air and feel how your weight is shifting on the underneath side of your body. Feel how your weight can shift on the ribs, on the hip, and that your breastbone can open towards the ceiling, that your chest can open towards the ceiling. And notice if that does something for the range of the movement. That's it, good. And then slowly bring yourself back again. 
let's see if we can add something else to it. Let's change what we're doing now. Rest your arms in any position you like there on your side. Feel that upper leg resting on the lower leg. And just lift the upper leg off of the lower leg. And feel what the weight of that leg is like to lift it in the air. Yeah, then put it back down and maybe lift it one more time just to feel what it's like. Lift the whole leg, not just the knee. Unless that's not available. Yeah, good, great. Now pause there for a moment. And uh, put it back down. I'm sorry, don't pause with it in the air. Good. Now let's just change that a little bit. How about you lean on the foot and you just lift the knee? So you're gonna leave the foot resting on the other foot and you just lift the knee and you lower the knee and you lift the knee and you lower the knee. So you pivot on the foot, you pivot on the foot. And as you pivot on the foot and the knee comes up, notice what happens in the pelvis. What happens in the pelvis? Good. Yeah. Okay, and then keep your knee resting on knee. So don't do something that hurts, Kim. Definitely don't do anything that hurts. And let the knee resting on the knee and lift the foot. Lift the foot. So you could do it in your imagination. You can uh, look to see if there's a different way to do it. You can just skip that movement for now. So now this is a very different movement in the pelvis, isn't it? Notice the difference in the hips now. Okay, now pause and lift the knee. Rest on the foot, lift the knee, and then lower the knee, rest the knee, lift the foot. And then lower the foot, lift the knee, and then that's it. Good. Some of you falling asleep on me, that's okay. No worries about that. I'm not sure I'll fall asleep with this music, but maybe you can. <laughs> Good, let it go for a moment. Just bring your whole leg into the air and see how that is for you. Is that a little lighter, a little easier? Okay, let's see if it has anything to do with taking the arm behind your back. So bring your arms back in front of you at shoulder height. Begin to slowly lift the hand while your head and eyes follow, follow, follow. Let your head and eyes, your chest, your breastbone open so that you're not straining the neck and see if it's now getting possible to take the arm further behind you. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a goal, but some of you are now reaching the floor pretty easily. And others of you, I see just a really huge increase in the range and it looks comfortable. I hope it's comfortable. Good, and then come back and then turn and line on your back, please. Okay, so as you rest here now, just feel what's different about this quality of connecting with the ground. And you may not want as much padding under your head as you had on your side, you can decide that. What's, what's different about the way your right side of your body is on the ground? What's different about the way your left side of your body is on the ground? How's the quality of your breathing? And slowly, slowly roll your head a little to the left and a little to the right. And notice if there's anything different about the quality of rolling that there are, it feels easier perhaps, or the range has improved. Not as much strain, more ease. And then let that go and just feel your breath. It can be a big difference sometimes in the way that we breathe from the beginning of a lesson to the end of the lesson.
and then slowly roll yourself through your side up to sitting. Take your time to come up in the easiest possible way for you. And then when you feel comfortable, you'll come up to stand. Don't worry about the camera. Let the camera go. Stay with your own sensation. Much more important to stay with your own sensation than to start fiddling with the camera. I don't need to see you for this part. And you don't need to see me. And just stand, just feel your weight in your feet. Feel the breath across your shoulders. Feel your height. Yes, sometimes we do need somebody to lean on and sometimes it turns out we can just change our leaning on the ground and get some incredible support. Walk around a little bit and feel what it's like for you. Good. That's it. And then when you're ready, you can slowly come back and set yourself up to sit and we can chat a little bit. You can put in your, the comments if you like what your experience was, lesson. I'm reading some of the comments that have been made while I was talking earlier appreciate from hearing from Philip about his experience with Feldenkrais lessons and the impact it's had on his, on his uh, struggle with fibromyalgia. Yes, so uh, Lola, the nine week course is gonna be on Monday nights or Friday mornings. And then the courses throughout the year, some of them will be in that same pattern, but some will be on Wednesday morning, some will be week challenges, which will uh, be like Monday through Friday. And I don't know what time those will be yet, but they'll probably be in the morning. Um, on Mondays, it's 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And on Fridays, it is 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And when you follow the link that Arlene is putting for you in the comments, you scroll down that really long page, there is um, a schedule of the classes that are going to be coming up. Feeling it in my jaw. What is this? Feeling in my jaw. What is this feeling in my jaw? That's a good one. Yeah. Good. And I want to thank, um, I'm sure Rosanna, I'm glad. I want to just thank some people here that have already signed up. So Pam signed up. Woo, let's see here. Adelaide signed up. Francis signed up. Good grief. Judith signed up. Anne signed up. Mm. Pamela signed up. Those are the ones that I see easy to grab. There's somebody else here. Barbara signed up. So lots of signups already. So great. So while people are considering whether they want to sign up now and get access to be in the um, in the uh, um, for the drawing, which is the advantage of signing up now while we're online together, the drawing, um, then I'll, I'm going to take other qu questions. So so will there be recordings of all the course days? Uh, yes, there'll be recordings of the courses. People in your learning body will have a really easy place to go grab them. People that are only signed up for the nine week will have to download them and keep them. Uh, thanks, Jackie, about my husband. I appreciate that. Um, and there was another question on there. Uh, okay. Abelda asked, I have arthrosis and I've joined Bones for Life and I wonder which is better for me, Feldenkrais or Bones for Life? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I would have to ask, have more conversations with you and, and possibly Imelda 
you know the answer from your experience tonight and how it's different from Bones for Life. So I think either could be fine. One might be better for anybody at a given point in their life. But it, it, you know, it could change from uh, a, a year from now. But uh, you know, we could talk about it a little bit more as you try to make that decision. Um, Let's see here, let me scroll down on the questions so I get to the ones. What time my Monday, Friday lesson feels like? But the lesson starts September 14th. And they, uh, the classes will be about two hours. So we'll start with a key to your learning body. And it will usually be a discussion, then there'll be a lesson. And then there'll be up to a half an hour for question and answers. Because I found last time there wasn't enough time for qu people's question and answers. So I'm adding more time. So, I mean, you could leave after that, after the lesson for sure, if you wanted to. You didn't have to stay for the questions and answers. Um, and let me go down here. I was on my right side. Wendy says, I was on my right side. SI joint isn't particularly happy in this moment. Will we be doing our other side today? No, we're not going to do our other side today. Um, we're not particularly addicted to doing other sides in the Feldenkrais work, but you can do the other side. It was a fairly simple lesson, so you could possibly remember it after we get offline and take yourself through it. And or you could um, wait tomorrow until you get the replay, because then we're going to go to sleep after this, not too long after this, but the replay won't be ready before we go to bed. That's what I should say. We could do it on the replay and do the other side. A lot of times those things after a lesson, they're a little uncomfortable, actually resolve, I'd say 90% of the time they resolve themselves in a very short period of time. Occasionally, they'll last a little bit longer. Yes. We don't necessarily do things symmetrically, and it has a lot to do with this noticing the difference between this and that, right? So I talked about the ability to sense differences. And so we create conditions where it's easier to notice differences. So sometimes they're symmetrical, sometimes they're not. Uh, Carl, easier to get up to stand. Cool, very cool. I'm glad I enlightened your afternoon. Uh, and to, and to, uh, and to go on. I wonder how that goes. I and mean, I'd like to know how to pronounce that. Um, will there be recordings of all the course days? I think I answered that. How many hours per week per day? I don't really understand that question. You'd have to ask that another way for me. Uh, Deborah had a nice chest opening and spiral unwind and found a, a weakness on the right side. From the first lesson. Okay. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is have you raise your your virtual hand. So if you go to the participants area, you'll see a raise hand function. If you would raise your hand, I'm going to unmute some of you and um, uh, We'll take some questions or comments that way. Okay, and the questions can be about the Feldenkrais method. It could be about the lesson. It could be something about your own experience. It could be about the upcoming um, membership. You will not get the recording yet tonight because I'm. I want to go to bed. I want, I want to go bed. They don't come that fast. So the process of us getting the recording, downloading it, uploading it, that all takes several hours. So I'm going to go to bed before then. We'll get it in the morning. Um, okay, any kind of questions? No, no questions. Nobody wants to hear their own voice. I wore you out. Please uh, ask, put your hand up and let's take the questions that way. So I'm going to get Marlene. So Marlene, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Um, thanks for this, by the way. Uh, this is my first exposure to Feldenkrais, and I've heard about it for all my life, but I've just never had the opportunity. So I appreciate this first um, 
experience. Um, I've had problems with TMJ on and off over my life, and I feel it in my jaw uh -huh. um, from that last exercise. A um, in a bad way or a good way? Um, you don't know. Like it's, well, not great. Like it's, you know, I feel like it's, you know, when you exercise a muscle, you haven't, and then it's all, all of a sudden like, oh, it's waking up. Mm -hmm. thing. And I'm just wondering, did I do something wrong or, you know, I mean, I guess you, since you didn't see it, you don't yeah. know how I actually performed the exercise. No, I, I, uh, I doubt that you did anything wrong, but I think that what you're going to discover as you continue to do the work is um, the, that there's some times when you're unnecessarily tightening and probably right before this unnecessarily tightening, you're holding your breath. So as we be able, as we're able to slow down and pay attention and I'm able to coach you more and more, you're going to feel those moments. And the more that you can find earlier and earlier in the sequence, what it is you're actually doing, you now have a chance to do something different. So you mostly notice yourself now, once the problem is already present, but you can learn to notice yourself before the tension increases. So that'll be a, a learning for you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I mean, there's no, I don't really think there's a re reason to think, although I know we do think of it this way about doing it wrong. It's more a process of discovery and questioning. So it'll be interesting for you if you consider, you know, to keep going with it, Marlene. I think it, you'll be surprised how much you can get from it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For that. Um, I'm going to go to Sharon. Give you an unmute, Sharon. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding. If I sign up month to month, um, you can you can use it to try things out and see if this is the right time and the right system, and and drop out after any month. Yeah. And also, do, if you sign up month to month, do you there's a course that's starting. Do you also do the course? I didn't quite understand. As long as you're still in, in the membership while the course is going, you can get the course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, you can't change from month to month to yearly. The technology isn't there. So if you decided you loved it and you wanted to change yearly, you're, you're actually stuck in the monthly. Um, uh, to change it, it would be the next time that you signed up, and it would be whatever the yearly price is. It's just difficult to make some things work. It seems like it would all be easy, but it's not. So that's the only thing I would say about, about monthly, okay? Understood, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, that was Sharon, I think. So let me lower her hand. Let's hear from Jan Joy. Hello. Hi. Uh, your picture disappeared, but anyway, um, I signed up and I'm Yay, excited. Yay, Jan Joy. <laughs> I'm excited about possibility. Mm -hmm. I'm holding on to that word. Uh, as being uh, my mantra now that anything is possible Good. and I appreciate you being here even though I'm in Hawaii you feel like you're right here with me oh I'm so and glad I'm so glad you just took the nine week the other course that wasn't nine it was seven right you were in that with me Did you, and you liked it yeah oh well, yeah yeah good you're, you're back and signing up good for you yes thank I'm you dear welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me find Kathleen. I think I saw Carl come up and ask if there, he has to sign, sign. You don't have to tell us which class you want to come to. You can show up for Monday one week. You can show up for Friday the next week. We just ask that you don't show up for both in the same week. So, uh, but you're in control of that. And that's just so we can spend quality time with people. Uh, so we ask that you not show up twice in one week. Catherine. Hi there. So I'm just delighted to meet you in person, seen your name for years. Hello. And I thought it, yeah, I thought it'd be fun since you had a brand new person to have a question from somebody who was like not brand new at all. Oh, oh gosh, you're going to be a challenge. You're not. Brand <laughs> no, new not a challenge. Just no, go a ahead. Challenge me if you like. It's fine. Yeah. No, no, no. But I thought it would be interesting for people, whether they're new or experienced, to hear something about the relationship between 
that area up here and here and the hips because yeah. just for me by the way so i had one hip replaced and i'm a really avid skier and i didn't know if i'd ski again and i was skiing better and like no problem at all and then covid hit right in the middle of ski season and then i couldn't ski this year and my right hip started getting worse so I was just intrigued. I came to this just for the fun of it, and it didn't occur to me it would be have anything to do with my hip at all. But then I was intrigued. So I'd love to have, yeah. hear it for me, but for everybody about yeah, the yeah. relationship between all that and then the hips. Okay, I, I'd love to answer that. Thank you for asking. Let me get us a little skeletal model. So, you know, it, uh, people are different, but also cultures are different, right? And uh, so some cultures, they will use the movement of the ribs quite a lot. But in at least the American culture, this is not the case. There's not a lot that happens here. And if there is, it often tends to be the lower ribs and not these ribs up underneath here. Now, when also when we look at this pelvis these legs the truth of the matter is when we think of our hip joints we mostly think out the sides right and a lot of us have myself included have a problem on one side right where we have a tendency to have some chronic kind of discomfort because every time we step under that leg we we actually don't know where the strength of the hip joint is so for Catherine, she's used to hearing some word about coming up over the high point of the hip. Well, it turns out the high point of the hip is interior. It's not out here, it's interior. So the strength of the hip joint is actually along the inside of this ball and down the inside of the leg, not the outside. Now, uh, one of our colleagues, one of Catherine's and my colleagues, Elena Netafor, talks about the small pelvis. So the big pelvis, the small pelvis this little area through here. Huh, well, that's an interesting idea. And this, I think, is if we could get our minds wrapped around, more around the sensation of the interior aspect of the hip joint and the small pelvis, this is actually really where the strength of the system lies. And we can kind of go to see that structurally. It's like, hold it, we want to be sitting in this area. This is the, the big support. It's not really way out here. So we can kind of see that. Now, what's available for most of us to move a lot is the lumbar and the hips. That's the easy part to, to move. So it's very easy to develop some kind of habit in the way we use ourselves in walking that gradually alienates us from the mobility of the rib cage as part of walking. And then what, what Feldenkrais does in this lesson is he gets us into a position where the pelvis cannot do what it normally does. And that is that cross-legged sitting position where actually the, the legs are kind of up and they're almost higher. And by the way, if someone felt like they wanted to explore that and they can't be in cross-legged sitting, but they'd like to get an even bigger approximation of this, sit with your pants on and go sit in your toilet seat so that your bottom drops a little bit through the toilet seat and then prop your feet up on a stool. And that will really limit, you don't even have to cross the legs then, that will really limit this, this habitual shearing in the pelvis and it will really bring that movement right on up here into those top ribs, into those top ribs. Now, this guy is not you know, gonna be oriented toward that. This guy or gal is not gonna be oriented towards that. But when we get some of that mobility back here, when you stand up and you've kept the pelvis quite still and it, the system is feeling, oh, hey, oh, hey, there's this tiny little bit of weight shift in this interior space. I'm not used to that. I don't know what, I, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about the inside of these hip joints. I'm used to out here and out here and out here and out here. It immediately puts it to use when you stand up. Immediately puts it to use and goes, okay, 
because your system wants to upgrade, right? Your system wants to upgrade. I mean, it likes habit. It needs habit for sure. You need habit. You need good enough moving. But anytime you give the nervous system an opportunity to feel that it has done something that would allow it to um, be better at survival, and that means better at balance. So survival, balance, these things go together. And if you're better at balance, that means you're better to go in any direction. If something comes up that's unexpected, your nervous system is gonna, gonna notice that. It's gonna go, okay, oh, oh, game on. She is gonna be able to do something more in, on uneven terrain than she's able to do before. A nervous system is not interested in helping you have hip joints that last for 30 or 40 years. Not in a system. It's not in its idea at all. It's only interested right now, what can you do to have better balance right now? It thinks nothing at all about what's gonna to happen to your hips if you walk the way you walk 30 years from now. So it will do whatever it can to give you the best possible organization for quick action now, but it will always be just good enough because it doesn't think ahead to the future, right? That that's not its doing. But when it gets a glimpse, a glimpse of something that makes it better, it's like, oh, okay, hold it. I want that. I want that. So now you have a glimpse. So what you get in the Feldenkrais lessons is a lot of, of uh, what Ken Wilber calls peak experiences in his integral uh, model. And he says, you know, peak experiences by themselves aren't integratable but they give you a taste, a hunger of what's possible so that you do another lesson, that you do another sit down, that you do something more. And so it's, it's this process of con en engaging with Feldenkrais and what he calls the process of, of and life is a process, engaging with the process over and over again for being able to continually expand out a little bit more from another lens, right? Catherine, all these lessons, she knows how many different lessons we have and how it just keeps filling out another lens, another idea, like in this idea of rib mobility, which is in the function, for us, it is the function about walking and running. Almost everything for human beings, well, any animal, is about the ability to walk or run. This is the primary way we survive. So thank you so much. Thank you. I hope it was a good answer. <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful. Just love doing it and hearing more. Of course you do. <laughs> You've been in it for how many years now? Uh, I need to unmute you again. It looks like it's not going to let me to. I don't even see. Sorry. Maybe you'll put it in the comments. Uh, Barry. Hi, Cynthia. I'm um, just wondering to what extent you're going to incorporate Bones for Life lessons or principles in this program. Uh, some principles, but it's not primarily a Bones for Life program. That is a separate training program for sure. Um, there's some key Bones for Life lessons within the library, but I don't plan to offer pure Bones for Life classes. There will be, uh, for people with mobility challenges, there will be an occasional Wednesday morning class, Wednesday morning in my time zone, uh, that'll have some Bones for Life in it, but again, it won't be pure Bones for Life. But most of the classes will be pretty pure Feldenkrais, pretty pure Feldenkrais. So I consider this a Feldenkrais membership with uh, some Cynthia spin to it, but it, I do consider it to be a Feldenkrais membership. Yeah. Anyone else? Glad you like that insight, Philip, on the hips. Catherine was in the Amherst training. Ah, oh, gosh, so she studied with Moshe. I knew you were back a ways. Thank you. I feel privileged she even showed up to be with me. Um, anybody else? We are we, did we got it? We got the questions? Yes, Regina, you can ask something for sure. Do you know how to raise your hand or shall I just try to find you to unmute you? Maybe you don't know how to do that. Let me see if I can find your name. Unmute you. 
It's good to see you too, Lori. You were in my training, so I always love seeing you. Uh, Regina, I'm going to try to unmute you, Regina. You'll have to accept that. Oh, yeah, I think I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I tried to raise the hand, but I don't know. I went through the reactions and did a little hand, but it keeps on disappearing, so I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm doing wrong. Um, since I have a three hour delay from you guys because of the time zone, how long the course, the nine week course, how long is each um, lesson or each, uh, each part of the course? Two hours. And the last half hour is pretty much Q and A. We shouldn't probably, we probably will be done with the lesson in the last half hour. I just tried to, I tried doing like an hour and a half recently an hour and 45 minutes it was just not quite long enough for the amount of questions that people had so i'm just trying to make sure people can ask their questions because there are usually in these courses there's usually quite a few people who are brand new and that will have questions and that's reasonable so okay and like wednesday morning lessons and things if i can't attend because of the time difference and because i work then I could get replays of those if I can't. You'll them. absolutely have replays of them. So really the, the, the membership used to be almost entirely pre-recorded lessons. Mm -hmm. And with COVID, what I decided, there's two things I've decided. And one, there seems to be two types of people. And there's the type of person who really is very self-motivated and they go to the library regularly and they find the stuff they want to do when they want to do it. Yahoo, Meg, thanks for signing up. It'll be good to have you. So they, they do them when they want to do them and yeah. they do great that way. And then there's people that really need a class, that that's what makes them show up is knowing that there's a time, that there's a teacher that's going to see them, that they're going to be interacting with other people. And I think that's always been true, but with the situation with COVID, I've decided um, I wanted to make it more of an emphasis. And so I'm putting a lot of live classes into it. You won't be nonstop. It's not like live classes all week long. There'll be some, I mean, all year long, there'll be some breaks in between, but, uh, and hopefully you'll learn to go back and forth maybe between, you know, the library and live and the library and live, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, so you, there always will be replaced. So the thing is to know yourself. Like, am I somebody who's going to be able to tune in and use it? Now, I don't know you, which time zone are you in. It's close. Uh, I'm three hours behind. I'm in Canada. You're, no, well, Canada's a big range of time zones. Are you in the Pacific? Yeah. You're in Pacific. So that's why I thought that for you that the Friday morning would work because it's at 10, which is your time, 7 a.m. Yeah, so, but I have a toddler, so Friday he's not in daycare. So then. Uh, okay. Well, I tried. <laughs> and he's away. That's what that time so, phone was almost so, for. Yeah. I just tried. So Monday Sorry. evening, like 3 in the afternoon, would probably be better because he'll like. He yeah, so day Mondays day. is 3. Well, Monday one is 3 in the afternoon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Monday will probably be more achievable for me. But uh, unless my husband's home, unfortunately, I would. Yeah, oh, I understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, these are the reality. The reality I, um, I love to be live because it's a different experience, I think. I think, and mm -hmm. um, it's nice to be live. Uh -huh. um, I like both. And sometimes with time, you know, you, you have busy lives and it's hard to make time. Then, yes, if you have a class, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this live, then you kind of more likely maybe to make the time and show up instead of, oh, library is always there, but then it's also easy to just. Right, and I, I'm hoping the kind of dancing back and forth will help a few people that yeah. tend to fall off, to fall back in, tend to fall off and fall back in. I'm, I mean, I'm somebody who falls off the wagon regularly on any kind of self-care thing. So anything that allows me to sort of re-engage with people and reinvigorate myself. And I think, I think the timing might do that for people. So we'll see. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judy, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Um, Hi. Well, I, I watched the session only, just as you see me here. This is all I did um, for various reasons. I'm kind of exhausted. I feel like my body did a lot of this stuff. It's a in certain places specifically in the the tops of my legs and in my 
shoulders. I, I, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious about that. It, it feels very real that those muscles did something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Well, it's hard to know, isn't it? Like that can be the power of the imagination. I hope you were actually imagining some of the movements. Yes, yes. I was so, very you know, depending on, I mean, there's a, re there's a couple reasons imagination can be very powerful. One reason is that it allows us to stay at the level of the initial impulse. And mm -hmm. when you can stay at the level of the initial impulse, you can start to really map out a new pathway. Mm -hmm. But another reason that it can be powerful is because the brain doesn't know the difference between imagined and real. No. And this is how some of us develop right. phobias by watching a, a movie, right? Uh, or somebody else telling us a story, or we actually are traumatized by somebody else telling mm -hmm. us, or we're secondhand, we're not even the one it's experienced. So the, the brain really does take in these imagined, these imagined things and it runs it through the same pathways wow. uh, if you were doing it. So, I mean, it's not my recommendation that you would sit and right. every time and not, and, you know, that I would like, I would want to see you gradually feel confident in yourself and your ability to begin to also move because there, there is a reality to, um, uh, motion is lotion. Okay. So there's the, the motion, the actual real motion begins to lubricate your joints, begins to, to define nerve slide and glide and a muscular fascial slide and glide. You may not get as much of that sure. um, increased circulation from the imaginary work. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen. Right. You know, there's certainly people who do incredible work in their imagination for healing fractures or other kinds of injuries, but it's not the typical pathway. Yes. We do know that the more, there's, there's two things that we know for health. One is that you do have to have movement for health. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that is important. And where I think that the Feldenkrais work is key is that we think the quality of the movement matters right? The quality of the movement matters. And as the quality of the movement uh, increases, you're more likely to actually move as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you for your observation. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, Kathy. Hi. I really enjoyed that first movement. That was great. I just got such tremendous sense of balance and confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about the yearly because I'm curious about that one particularly. And um, does that include the, a library of your other classes that you've developed? Does it include other teachers than Larry and yourself? And then um, is it possible to see what's in that library? It does not include very many other teachers at all. Um, that it is primarily a library of my own, almost, uh, or my husband's. Um, I don't have a lot of guest teachers. It does not include all of my work by any means, Kathy. I mean, my Integral Human Gate work is a separate program and the Bones for Life work is a separate program and they deserve to be separate programs um, from this price point, you know. So um, I would say, uh, I don't know what your background is with the Feldenkrais work, so you might say something more about that, but you know, I have both very commonly taught lessons and very uncommonly taught lessons. So uh, a lot of times in public classes, we've gotten into some habits over the years where we really stick with a very narrow range, but I have a pretty big range of challenge, and I don't necessarily mean that in uh, like, pretzel positions, but challenge mentally uh, as well, uh, uh, in a challenge in the extreme use of the imagination, for example, can be a big challenge. Uh, uh, certain positions that you uh, might be in that you would be surprised that you would be able to function in, um, or that might lead to unusual positions. So it's a pretty wide range. And then I also have short videos for people to do daily. So my, my recommendation is that people try to learn to do a 
short movement video pretty much every day as much as you can and then once a week do a longer movement lesson the closer that you can come to that i think the more uh success you'll have in reaching the goals that you want to have for yourself how short are the daily videos 15 minutes or less usually okay does that help and what else is uh, different unique that's different i've been doing other you know programs i'm just curious what what david david zemock i don't know if you know him uh -huh. david Z yeah i've been doing some stuff with him yeah, I and mean, then, there, there's so many incredible teachers out there you can't mm -hmm. i definitely would not want to compare quality of teaching between us i think you know, I, what is different is that I'm going to really help you hone in on these seven keys and keep help trying to help you figure those out. You would be in a community with people as much as you want to be. So, and I would encourage you to actually participate in the community of it. I think it makes a difference mm -hmm. uh, that you, we can have powerful Facebook uh, community groups that uh, one of the things that I've been just shocked at is these programs I've signed up for that have nothing to do, apparently nothing to do with human growth, and the communities are robustly about human growth, and people are helping each other out, and then I look mm. at the Feldenkrais groups, I'm like, what the heck, we're hardly doing anything, so there's no reason why they can't have robust communities with each other, mm -hmm. and then also, um, I mean, I have a path of success to help you sort of guide yourself about like what what stage am i at in my somatic development and where can i expect to go with this that would be mm -hmm. probably unique so and, the, oh, sorry there if you want to have a lot of variety between teachers then you'll need to go and sign up at some uh, uh, between other programs that's definitely not what i what i um offer i'm not gonna say that you're gonna be never gonna be guest speakers but it's not a lot because I'm trying to figure out what I would do with the whole year, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the class is nine, nine weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what else would I be, um, can I look forward to for the rest of that year beyond have, the nine? Yeah, I mean, you're going to have more classes and more challenges. They won't, again, they won't be nonstop. You'll have breaks, but you'll, you'll have a interesting year. <laughs> Oh, a very interesting year. Is there anybody here who's, who's, who's been on your um, membership for a year who could talk about how they've there used? There's people that already posted that have been here four or five years. I have people that have been with me since. Oh, the yeah, I saw those posts. Yeah. yeah, so, and they were here for since the beginning and they haven't even had the live classes hardly. That a lot, the live classes are a new function this year. I mean, I was doing one a month last year but doing them in series like this is a, is a new function. So there be, people normally come and stay, to be honest, the, hmm. they, they like it. So the turnover is pretty low, but you do have a lot of good questions. So, you know, it's, it's important for you to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Kathy. Uh, does that you, Kathy? That was, that was me. Yeah, <laughs> you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, I think it might be it. You guys are wonderful to stick with me and each other. I like that. So Jan Joy, who just took the class as a saying, it's a really great fit for her. I thought quality, not quantity and ever evolving. Um, Okay, anybody else? Well, I so appreciate you all hanging. Oh, there's a couple more. Just when I think there's not. How about Anne-Marie? Mute. Okay, hi, Cynthia, can you hear me? I can, Anne-Marie. You can? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I. I just did, completed the Feldenkrais 101. Right. So then I wouldn't do that again, right? Yeah, it's a whole different set of lessons. Oh, it's different lessons. Oh, uh -huh. okay. And because you just did Feldenkrais 101, I have a discount coupon for you. So if you didn't get it 
um, email me at support and I'll make sure you get it. I did get it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a whole so different set of lessons. What isn't different in, is perhaps the discussion around the seven keys, but that might also unfold differently. Right. Okay. Um, I, I know you have a, a special program for, for the back, which is, uh -huh. uh, will, some, will some of that, what's it called? Your better back. Yes, that's right. Do you, will any of that find its way into the, the year long membership? Uh, it won't be structured that way. I mean, there are definitely some shared lessons between the two uh, programs, but it will not be structured as a year better back program. No, I, it's, I, I guess what I'm struggling with is how to know where I would best fit and if it would be better for me to sign up for your better back. Your Better Back is a 14 week program. It's not an ongoing program. Once it's done, it's done. Right. Um, and uh, it may get offered in January, but I don't know that yet. It may not. Okay. Uh, so I don't know when I'm going to do it yet again. It, if it doesn't come in January, it'll probably be next, uh, the end of next May. Okay. That so, might be decided. It, Okay, and if I use the discount code from the Feld, Feld, Feldenkrais 101 right now, um, how, will that sign me up still within the time of our yep. conversation? Yep. Okay, and it's U.S. dollars, I assume, the it prices. Is. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think that's actually me. I think that's a different Cynthia. So I'm unmuting whoever is Cynthia. I think my, my don't have that by my name. Cynthia, thank you, Kathleen, for hanging out. Is there a Cynthia besides me here? Okay, no? Okay, lower that hand. Okay, yeah, there was somebody else, I think, earlier that said something about Scoliosis. Um, my, I wish I had kept track of that question. Um, um, so, you know, scoliosis um, is, um, I mean, first of all, there's such a wide range of degrees in scoliosis. And then you, if you look at the age ranges within scoliosis, so the Older age ranges with scoliosis are slightly less malleable or a lot less malleable. And our emphasis is more on finding comfort and strength and, and ways to keep it from going in the wrong direction. When someone is younger in their childhood years or maybe even before 30, there can be still a lot of malleability in the bony structure and there can be a lot more that can happen within scoliosis. Um, but I do think the Feldenkrais method is, is quite lovely for, for people with scoliosis. And Freddie, I'm going to admit, unmute you. My question is whether um, this um, monthly program or the yearly whatever would be something that you would see as a valuable adjunct for somebody who's in um, the Bones for Life immersion programs? I, I think it's, personally, I think it's too much. Okay. Uh, I mean, some of you are just, if you really feel like you want to do it, again, Freddie, I'll give you some kind of discount code, but personally, I think it's too much. It's a lot. Um, so it's up to you, up to you, you, but that's a big, hefty program. Yeah, I'm gonna say thanks to Pat for signing up and Tamara for signing up and Susan for signing up and Judith for signing up and golly, this is great. We're gonna have so much fun together. Mark for signing up. We are gonna have a lot of fun. It's, it can be both deep, Regina for signing up, deep and, um, and fun. Mary signing up. Yeah, thank you, Mary and Sharon for signing up. So lots of good signups. Okay, we're getting ready to end. So uh, you've got about two minutes left to sign up if you want to get in the bonus. And uh, otherwise, 
um, I'm getting ready to say goodbye. Get ready to say goodbye. Let's see. Thank you very much for the how often do you offer the Bones for Life program? Carl, you need to send me an email. There is uh, an option, a last minute option opening up to get into the Bones for Life program, but then it won't again probably be for, uh, I, would, I would guess I'm a year because I have to commit to people for like a two year period. So I don't, I can't, there's just so many things you can do at once. I'm already trying to do too many. <laughs> so my, one of my habits is I try to do too many. So send us an email to support at futurelifenow.com if that's what you want to look at. And I'll tell you what those options are. Make sure you're on the list for that. Um, yeah, well, I hope you want to get the bonus, Pat. Let's see what happens if you're on the drawing or not. Okay, thank you all for sticking with me. Thank you very much. I'll watch for the replay tomorrow and uh, we'll get it out as soon as we're able to. Appreciate your exploring with me. It's lovely. Bye-bye.